Hungary. A former president now charged criminally with seeking to interfere with the lawful transfer of power after an election. A person who is now the front runner in the Republican primary for the next election. We're going to go now to an NBC News special report. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good afternoon. We're coming on the air with breaking news. Former President Trump has been indicted in the special counsel's investigation with four new charges filed for efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. This marks the first time a former president has been charged in connection to disrupting the transfer of power between administrations. Today's indictment also comes just days after that same special counsel, Jack Smith, filed superseding charges against the former president in a separate case related to his handling of classified documents after leaving office. Mr. Trump also faces separate criminal charges for a third case in New York State, where earlier this year he pled not guilty to charges involving hush money payments during his 2016 campaign. But today's new charges could be among the most significant. Legal challenges Mr. Trump is facing and a reminder he has denied any wrongdoing in all these cases. Let's bring in our senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. You literally just received <laughs> yeah. the indictment. You've had a chance to go through it. Four charges. Can you tell us what they are? Yes, Lester. This really uh, focuses on all of the efforts that the former president undertook to try to overturn the will of the people to overturn the election results it is not, at least as on this first reading, about the violence that took place at the Capitol. As you can see there on your screen, obstruction-related charges, specifically obstructing the congressional vote count that happened on January 6th and all of the steps that the former president and his allies took to try to stop that count, to try to, try to stop the peaceful transition of power. So we're gonna go through this. It is lengthy, spanning about 45 pages, but again, the former president of the United States, for the first time in history, has been indicted for trying to thwart the last election. And to frame this from the beginning, this was never necessarily about the riot itself of January 6th, but what the prosecutors believe may have sparked that riot. Well, and we had wondered for some time exactly what the charges would be. As everyone remembers those iconic images from the attack on the Capitol and the speech that he made preceding it. And we had wondered whether he would be charged with some sort of incitement related crime. And we're gonna need to go through it again. But on the first pass, this appears to relate to the actual steps that he tried to take to thwart the vote count. Right. So that's why we're going to, again, try to de <laughs> de I'll, I'll, I'll give you yes. a moment to go through that. Let me bring in NBC's Garrett Haig, who has been covering the former president. Garrett, walk us through how this day has gone. By President Biden to somehow derail his campaign. Since word of the indictment has broken, a former president spokesman confirms to me that he was informed of the fact that he had been indicted. And the campaign sent out a lengthy statement using much the same language that they've used uh, in the face of his other legal challenges over the years, calling this an un American witch hunt, suggesting that it is purely political, even making hyperbolic uh, comparisons to 1930s Nazi Germany and Soviet authoritarianism to describe the of conduct here from the Justice Department going after uh, the former president. So uh, it, it's clear that he's going to fight this in the public sphere just as much as he fights it in a courtroom. That has already become such a key part of his presidential campaign, Lester. In fact, the former president's previous arraignments, particularly the New York arraignment, have been huge days for him from an online, online fundraising capacity. Things like this, which would have been badly damaging right away to other presidential candidates, haven't seemed to have the same effect. The former president will be making this, I think, a key part of his campaign going forward as he fights these charges in the legal system. All right, Garrett, we'll ask you to stand by. Let me bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Hallie Jackson. And, and Hallie, uh, Garrett just walked us through some of the things the former president has said, trying to uh, liken this to election interference in the 2024 election. Remind us again how this investigation began and the timing. It was before Mr. Trump was a presidential candidate. That's right, as far as the special counsel investigation and then the special counsel, the investigation itself, and then the special counsel, of course, was created after Donald Trump did become a presidential candidate this cycle. I want to hit on a couple of key points, Lester, that we are learning from this indictment. First, the next big date, uh, this indictment says that the former president has been summoned to appear on August 3rd, which is Thursday. So Thursday will be the day, based on this indictment, that we may uh, see the former president. I'll leave it to the legal experts to talk through whether or not that date could change based on 
on conversations with the former president's attorneys here. I would also note, and I think it's, a, I think big picture, right, remind people what this is based on, right? At the core of this indictment appears to be the former president's insistence that this election, the 2020 election, was stolen from him. It was not, that was not true. And this indictment lays out a series of examples related to the former president's mindset. The prosecutors here are saying Donald Trump knew that wasn't true. He knew it wasn't true when he persisted in making these claims that were not founded of election fraud. He'd been told directly, they say he'd been informed directly that this was not the case. And yet he continued to make those claims through the election, after the election, before January 6th, after the January 6th. In fact, and this is not in the indictment, this is sort of me just telling you based on the reporting here, Donald Trump continues to make those claims even today, that the 2020 election was stolen from him illegally. Again, it was not. There is no evidence of widespread fraud in the 2020 election. And I think it is interesting as we're looking through this indictment that it very specifically lays out his mindset. Remember, his attorney general, even at the time, Bill Barr, came out publicly and said there was no evidence of widespread fraud. This indictment lays out multiple instances where the former president, people around him were told that it was not the case, Lester. Uh, and I think that mindset question has been an important one and continues to be an important one. All right, Pally, I'll ask you to stand by as well. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker joins me now. Uh, Kristen, we have seen everything leading up to this point. In fact, Mr. Trump himself has predicted this moment would happen. But to the extent that he's, he's campaigning off it and seems to be uh, enjoying his his uh, rise in the polls the reality is these are very 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 serious charges um going forward you're absolutely right lester these are very serious charges politically speaking we have seen former president trump really benefit from these indictments in the polls. And in terms of a spike in his fundraising, Lester, he's 37 points ahead of Ron DeSantis, his nearest GOP challenger. However, from a financial standpoint, if you take a look at what he's spent so far in 2023, he's outspent how much he has raised, his super PAC has, in legal fees. So that speaks to the fact that this is starting to chip away at his overall operation as he runs for re-election. But again, politically speaking, we have seen his polls increase. We've seen a spike in fundraising. That's the primary. What happens in the general election? That's another matter. We've gotten recent polling out just this week, Lester, that show that he is running neck and neck with President Biden. No surprise there. This is a deeply divided country. We expect whatever the ultimate general election race to be, to be a close one. So it's not a surprise that you would see um, President Biden, and former President Trump running neck and neck. But it does raise questions about what this could mean if, in fact, he is the Republican nominee. So at this point in time, we're seeing both sides of that. We're also watching in terms of the questions that remain to see how his Republican challengers respond to this, Lester. So far, you have a few of them. Chris Christie, Will Hurd, Asa Hutchinson really sharpening their attacks against the former president, saying that, look, these mounting legal troubles make him a weak candidate in a general election. But so far, you're not seeing a chorus of voices. Ron DeSantis walking a very fine line, for example. Will that start to change in the upcoming debate now just a few weeks away? We'll have to see. Lester. All right, Chris, and thank you. Let me bring in former U.S. attorney and senior FBI official Chuck Rosenberg. Chuck, for there to be a conspiracy, there have to be other individuals. We don't know who those are. Well, we don't know their names. At least they're not named in the indictment. But there's traditional charging language that prosecutors use in a conspiracy, Lester, citing to um, conspirators known and unknown to the grand jury. And then they list six known conspirators, not by name, but by description. Five of them are attorneys. One of the five attorneys is a Department of Justice official. And then the sixth known conspirator, again, not named, is a political consultant. So there are others that are clearly on the radar of Jack Smith and his team, others who joined in a criminal conspiracy with Mr. Trump. So we'll certainly learn their names. The prosecutors, of course, know their names, but they are identified specifically in the indictment uh, by the jobs they hold, the positions they held during the course of the conspiracy. Another point to make charging a conspiracy in a speaking indictment as the Smith team did 
gives us a tremendous amount of detail about the indictment and the allegations. So in that way, very similar, Lester, uh, to the indictment that was returned and then superseded in the Southern District of Florida. Speaking indictments with tremendous detail, I hope people read it carefully. These four charges we're looking at here now, uh, how will they be defended? How would they typically be defended? Do you see any obvious weaknesses in, in the government's charges? Well, I don't see weaknesses in the government's charges because I haven't had a, t a chance yet to read the indictment carefully. But assuming that the government can adduce and prove in court everything it alleges in the indictment, my quick uh, look at the indictment suggests that it's compelling and strong. That said, how do you defend against the case like this? So to your question, Lester, traditionally, typically, in these sorts of cases, the defendant will argue that he didn't have the requisite intent to commit these crimes. He may argue that he relied upon attorneys uh, for their advice and counsel, and by doing so, he should be absolved of any criminal liability. Simply put, the government always has to prove intent, and often in these types of cases, a defendant will claim that he lacked the requisite intent. But but, and this is important, there are numerous individuals also cited in this indictment who did the right thing by telling Mr. Trump that he lost the election. They are also listed in the indictment by position. The vice president of the United States, Department of Justice officials, the director of national intelligence, Department of Homeland Security officials, and officials from the White House Counsel's Office, Mr. Trump's internal counsels within the office of president. And so with all of those people um, telling Mr. Trump he lost and being uh, designated in the indictment as having done that, it becomes that much more difficult for Mr. Trump to claim he lacked the requisite intent. So that's how these cases are often sort of framed for battle, government proving intent, a defendant arguing he didn't form the requisite intent. Uh, but it seems here that the government, Mr. Smith and his team of prosecutors and agents have thought carefully about that already. All right, Chuck Rosenberg, thank you. Let me go to our senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. I bought you as much time as I could <laughs> I to read, read, read through this document. What stands out to you? Uh, a couple of interesting things. The, the story that the prosecutors are telling here is incredibly detailed, and we're still working our way through it. But to Chuck's point, talking about the former president's intent, on page seven, they lay out all of the times, and these probably aren't all the, the that they've collected, but they give some examples of the times that the former president was told that the things that he was saying publicly were flat out false. And the reason that they're doing that is because they need to show that he was acting with some sort of corrupt mindset. And they don't have to show um, that he was told directly that you're breaking the law, but the fact that they have on several different occasions here, people telling him there was no evidence of widespread fraud, people telling him that the vice president didn't single-handedly have the power to overturn the will of the people does bolster their case. And it's interesting, they specifically say, the defendant had a right, like every American, to publicly speak about the election. This is on page three. He was also entitled to formally challenge the results through lawful and appropriate means. What he was not allowed to do was to try to actually use improper means to overturn the election results. And the best example is, imagine for a moment that you think um, a bank has taken your money. You notice a strange withdrawal on your bank account, and you think that wasn't right. The right way to challenge that is to actually go through a process. The right way to challenge that is not to rob the bank. And that's essentially what they indicted him for here, was to use improper means. Even if he thought that he was the right elector, even if he thought that he had actually somehow won the election despite all of the evidence to the contrary, the prosecutors are saying here is you actually have to challenge it through the appropriate court, court process. Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the McCad TV family. Please like and share McCad TV. We love you all. Please support McCad TV Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.